on February 6, 1934, riots erupted on the streets of Paris. The city, usually known for its leadership of the Republican and Socialist revolutions of the past, was then experiencing upheaval of an entirely different sort. Right-wing radicals, in opposition to the left-wing government, protested eerily close to the French National Assembly. While historians agree that this protest was not an attempt at a coup, let's consider the alternative, that it was, and a greater conflict would break out. How would history have changed? Our point of divergence concerns the actions of two men, Benito Mussolini and Colonel Francois de La Roque. La Roque, the leader of the largest faction of the French far right, historically advocated for a constitutional grasp of power. Here, however, Mussolini pulls on more strings than usual. When it is made public that embezzler Alexander Stavisky had been protected by the left-wing government, public sentiment sours against the institution. Believing this to be the starting grounds for a right-wing revolution, Mussolini makes plans to coup the assembly in Paris. He invites Le Roque to Rome and encourages him to take leadership of the coup due to his popularity. Surprised by the international support, Le Roque begrudgingly agrees. A date is set a couple months out. Despite aiming for some time in March for the coup, the dismissal of Jean Chiap, current leader of the Paris police prefect, brings outrage from the far right. Heavily supportive of Chiap, their distaste for the government increases. Mussolini and La Roque take the initiative in response. They move the date of the coup up as much as possible. With equipment and combatants brought together quickly, La Roque brings his men together at Place de la Concorde on the evening of the 6th. Mounted police, made aware of the gathering just hours prior, sit on the bridge over the Seine River between the protesters and the National Assembly. Shots are fired. A protester, unprovoked, has started the bloodshed. Chaos now rules over France. Across the country, sections of the populace and military break away in support of the far-right rebellion. In response, other groups make their own moves. Believing the Republic too weak to achieve victory, the Communists and many Socialists in the ruling coalition ally under Communist Party leader Maurice Therese and declare independence in the South. The Republic must now hold off both the right and left. As we can see, however, this is not all of the chaos brought upon France. In the West, the Breton Republic, led by architect Morvan Marshall, declares war on La Roque personally, while keeping peace with all other factions. Towards the East, the region of Alsace, having been under contention between France and Germany for centuries, is now running rampant with German separatists. Led largely from Berlin by Paul Schall, they fight with the goal of annexation into the Reich. A major portion of the Republicans in Lorraine join the more fervent communist cause as a means to defend their land and their lives from further German claims. Given such continued losses in support and decisive defeats on the battlefield, the Republican government is drawing closer and closer to its final breaths. Despite the Republic's failure, its most staunch supporter, Britain, is not yet stopping its intervention in the war. London turns its eyes to Brittany, looking to secure a foothold on the continent if the Bretons can push and make an early peace. As for Italy, its support of the Nationalists is restricted to the Alpine regions of France. And yet, gains aren't exactly being made on this front. Mussolini wonders if his master plan will end up backfiring in favor of the communists. Much like the nationalists, though, 
the communists are fighting with little useful aid from their supporter, the Soviet Union. Their enemies control all of the original French Navy, and thus Therese and his men are embargoed on all sides. The only other faction left to mention now is the Alsatians. Despite pushes westward, the Alsatians are now being forced back towards their capital of Strasbourg in the east. In response, Hitler, wanting to gain some sort of land from the Civil War, signs into law that all German paramilitary members in Alsace are now citizens of Germany. He further proclaims that the Reich thus has a right and duty to intervene. Headlines read of this across the world. The next day, his forces are mobilized with a march into the Rhineland. Though Germany's action undermines the demilitarization zone set by the Allies at the end of World War I, Britain and Italy offer only diplomatic protests. The Rock and Therese, however, speaking over radio, make a verbal pact that should Germany move into Alsace, they will enact a ceasefire and ally under a united front in order to repel Hitler's forces. Emboldened by such a move, Stalin agrees to declare war on Germany should the united front be made a reality. For now, this is too much for Berlin. Germany refrains from moving into Alsace, but has in the least regained control of the Rhineland militarily with little meaningful response. That this is the end of tensions between France and Germany seems far too unlikely, however, especially considering that France and Russia have now moved just a bit closer. With foreign concerns addressed, Laroque and Therese consider how they can take control of the current situation and achieve victory. For the communists, their hope is to take out all nationalist forces in the southeast and then turn their focus to overwhelming the additional forces in the north while connecting the front with Paris. This strategy is already on the radar for the nationalists and concerns them greatly, fighting not only on two fronts, but from two disconnected regions proves quite a struggle. However, Le Roc and his army minister Philippe Pétain believe they can overcome the hurdles the communists pose. They devise the strategy of dépassement, a slower version of Germany's blitzkrieg. Dépassement relies on deep pushes into enemy territory using motorized units. These pushes cause opposing forces to become overextended and prone to breakthroughs where then simpler pushes out from the main corridor created serve to bring about victory. Having nearly brought together their two fronts via this strategy, the Rock and Patan move to solidify the ground they have gained and prepare their men for the next steps of dépassement. In the meantime, the communists and Bretons are unable to make the gains they need in order to see favorable outcomes. Despite the support from London, Brittany has been cornered near its capital. This situation is tenable, but has very little means for creating a counteroffensive. Some additional aid from Germany and the Soviet Union arrives via British shipping routes, but is not enough to change the status quo. For Therese, his men have made some gains in northern Savoy, but are still struggling to make pushes towards Nice and Marseille to the south. The strategy employed by the communists just doesn't seem to be as strong as predicted. Considering the poor supply situation they are experiencing, it will likely only get worse. Finally, the next phase in dépassement is ready. Patent sends notification of such to Le Roc, who now has only to speak the word and the largest offensive of the war shall begin. Before doing so, the Rock visits Versailles, giving a speech to government officials and the citizenry alike. Here, he promises to do what he terms, bring France back from the ashes to a position of leadership over Europe once again. The next morning, the northern dividing line between the nationalists and the communists ignites.
initially. The offensive is slow going, as the communists are able to keep a relatively stable front. However, the pressure being applied is starting to cause their defenses to crack. In the north, the nationalists have already shortened the front line, while in the west, the corridor has been better secured due to pushes out from its northern entryway. The international community views the ongoing offensive as the deciding factor of the war. In the late evening of January 10, 1936, the strategy of Depassement has now borne the fruit which had been hoped of it. Near present-day March Hostel, nationalist forces connect their northern and southern fronts. The Rock announces this to the world, and quickly the minds of the world's politicians are set. London and Moscow, no longer seeing a path to victory for their factions, begin to mend relations with the nationalists. Berlin, DC, and Tokyo, not having a hand in the war at present, consider how to best handle the newfound nationalist power. Finally, Rome is ecstatic. Not only have they made an ally in La Rock and his men, but they are now confident in bringing all of France under their wing. As the sun sets on this conflict, the powers of the world have either decided to forgive, forget, or smile in the face of the turmoil, death, and destruction which the French nation has experienced. Now begins the reign of fascism in Western Europe as the rest of the world sleeps. <laughs>